Man, that's pretty good. I, I don't know about you. My heart is full already. I have been blessed this morning by the singing, and uh, it's great to see a packed house. And uh, man, I'm glad you're here to this morning, and I hope you're excited about getting a message from God's Word. Um, today, we are going to begin our final sermon series in the book of Romans. Can you believe it? We are finally making our way to the end, but I don't want you to think that that we're going to be done this morning, just because I said we're in the conclusion. We're in the middle of the book of Romans, which is Paul's longest letter that he had written. So it only makes sense that he has a very long conclusion. So we'll be here for a few weeks, but I think we've done a pretty good job. I was looking at my records this morning. We started the book of Romans last year on the last Sunday of August, and we're probably going to finish, finish it up on the first Sunday of August this year. And I don't know about you, but I have been blessed going through this book. God has spoken to my heart. He's ministered to my heart. And what I get excited about is our last sermon series is simple. It's called Never Stop. That's why I got my t-shirt back out this morning. Never Stop. When I think about the Apostle Paul, I think about a man who never stopped. Man, this man was passionate about living for God. He was passionate about God's glory. He was passionate about using every single day, every single minute of his life to make a difference for God. And guess what he does to us? He challenges us to do the same exact thing. So as we come to the end of the book of Romans, as we go through the conclusion, Paul's going to tell us to never stop. And what he gives us in this last chapter and a half is a manual for healthy ministry. So never stop. And we're going to have a manual here for healthy ministry. Now, I love the way that God orchestrates things. I love the fact that we get to talk about healthy ministry at the same time of year that we celebrate God's faithfulness to West Florida Baptist Church. Pastor Dan was right. He was talking about it this morning. Guess what? Next week, we celebrate 51 years of God's faithfulness to us as a church. Will you praise the Lord for that again this morning? Man, I get excited when I think about our church, and I get excited when we were going through that song, Same God, and we were going through that song, I Trust in God, I Sought the Lord, and He Heard, and He Answered, and we repeat that over and over again. My heart gets full because I know how true that it is, that we serve the God who is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and man, when you look back on 51 years of history at this church, you know what you're going to find? You're going to find people who have been saved and whose lives have been totally transformed. And I'm looking out all across the room at people that, that I, I know when you got saved, and I know some of your salvation stories, and I know the work that God's done in your life. And it's incredible when we think about how good God has been to save us. I think about the way people grow in their walk with Christ and the way that they become sanctified. I think about all the answered prayers. I think about 51 years of loving God and loving others. And man, I just want to give God all the glory and honor and praise because he is the same faithful, powerful, miracle work in God that he's always been, and he is doing things in our midst still to this day. And so we get to celebrate that next Sunday. And I'll say a little bit more about some of the announcements at the end of our service. But all of that leads me to the title of the message this morning, which is simply this, Boast in Jesus. Boast in Jesus. What do you like to boast in? I think that's a good question that we have to stop and think about. What do you like to boast in? Now, I'm going to boast for just a little bit, so bear with me, okay, this morning, and uh, we'll get this illustration out, but I have to tell you all this morning that I'm a pretty solid athlete. I know that might surprise you. I'm not that tall, you know, but I'm pretty solid when it comes to sports. I mean, you put a ball in my hand, I'll figure it out. I'll do pretty good, and I take a glory in a lot of things that, that come with sports. Probably at the top of the list is the fact that I have dominated my brother Dave for most of our lives. <laughs> Dave, stand up so everybody can see you back there. Man. Little brother back there, I, dom I mean, if you add up our overall record, now I got to give him some, I never really dominated him in golf, he dominates me in that, I got to give him that one, but overall lifetime record, yeah, he might beat me in a lot of things today, overall lifetime record, I know I got him hands down, man, I just, I, I take a lot of glory and pride in that, so I have to call him out for that one right there, and now I'm in trouble because he's going to be bringing it after me. But when I think about sports, too, and I think about the most glory that I've gotten from sports, I have to go to one in particular, and that is softball. Man, I had some glory days in softball. Back when I was in college, I was a four-time all-star. Now, don't get me wrong. It was in intramural athletics, okay? So whatever. All right, still. 
College athletes, okay, four-time All-Star. I'll never forget my freshman year. I make the All-Star game. My first swing, I cranked it, foul ball, but it was a home run. Second swing, home run. Third swing, home run. By the time I took that third swing, I heard people on the other team saying, like, who is this guy? I flipped my bat, and I was like, I'm Mike Brown, and I'm here to stay. You know, it was just like that. (laughs) Just felt really good about it, man. I got a lot of glory when it comes to softball. Well, a few years later, enter Atlanta into my life. Now, Alana, she liked me. I was coming around. This is a true story. I'm not going to get into all those details, but she definitely liked me first. My head was just, I was a little clouded at that time, but I was coming around and we were actually working here at day camp that summer. We were together all day and then I was arranging things so that we were hanging out at night, but I was still kind of in denial um, that we were just friends. But when it all hit me that there was something different about this girl, it had to do with softball. There was a Saturday in July where we were having an all-day tournament. It just so happened to be on that Saturday she was also moving apartments. But I was still like, hey, hurry up and put your stuff in there and then come watch us play softball. I got a softball tournament. I want you to come watch me play. And she's like, I don't know. Maybe I'll see. And she made a really smart move. She didn't come. She didn't come because she didn't want... I was playing around is what she thought. I was doing too many games. and She wasn't going to like move and rush and get there to watch me play softball if she didn't even know where this relationship was going. But all day long, I'm out there and I'm just looking behind me. I'm looking for Atlanta. Where's, I wanted her to see me in all my softball glory, man. I wanted to make a diving catch. I wanted to crank a home run. I wanted to do something good. And all day long, I was looking for her and looking for her. And she never showed up. But about a month later, we were talking about getting married. That's about how quickly that changed. <laughs> and went down. She was right. But the sad thing is, she never really got to see me in all my softball glory. And I'll always have that regret as we go through our life. (laughs) I'm going somewhere with this. Do you understand that most of what we boast about in life is silly? Honestly, it's ridiculous if you stop and think about it. For me to get up here and boast about something like that is silly and it's ridiculous, especially when you compare it to who Jesus is, when you compare it to what he's done for us, when you compare it to what he's doing in our lives, every other boast in life pales in comparison to the point where it even looks silly and it even looks ridiculous that we would get all worked up, that we would take any pride in anything other than Jesus and who he is and what he's done for us on the cross. And here in Romans chapter 15, in these, this section that we're looking at today, Paul shows us what it looks like to properly boast in Jesus. And that's what we're going to be breaking down this morning. So let's jump right into it. The first thing I want us to see this morning is this. Boast in Jesus because Jesus uses us. Jesus uses us. Look at verse 14. It says here, And I myself also am persuaded of you, my brethren, that ye also are full of goodness, Filled with all knowledge, able also to admonish one another. I already mentioned to you that this is the beginning of the conclusion to the book of Romans. And in one sense, this is a very nice diplomatic approach that Paul's taking to ending his letter. You got to understand, Paul had never met the Romans, the Roman Christians. He had never been to this church. These were not his converts. This was not a church that he had planted. They didn't know him from Adam. They had only heard about him. He didn't know them from Adam. He had only heard about them. But yet he writes them his longest and heaviest letter. And then also at the end of it, he confronts them about them not getting along and about some of the division that was in the church. And so in one sense, you could look at this and say, hey, this is a pretty nice diplomatic approach to ending this letter to a group of people that he had never met. He's saying, I want you to know, I don't think that you're weak and foolish. In fact, you're full of goodness. You're filled with all knowledge, even to the point where you're able to admonish, you're able to instruct one another. But I want you to understand this morning, it's far more than just diplomatic. These are not just words that Paul's saying to make the Roman Christians feel good, to make you and I feel good. What he is genuinely saying to every single person there and to us today is, you have everything you need to be used for the glory of God. You are filled with goodness. You are filled with all knowledge. Now, I got to stop right here and I got to ask us this question. How can this be? How can it be that we are full of goodness and filled with all knowledge? How could it be that the church at Rome was? Didn't Paul just get done writing to them his longest and heaviest letter out of 
what he had written to anybody? Didn't they need a whole lot of instruction? Weren't they lacking in knowledge? Does anybody in here feel like you're lacking in knowledge? There's a whole lot of things you still don't know in life. Especially the older you get, the more you realize how far short we fall in that category. How could this possibly be? How could this be, especially considering the fact that they're filled with all goodness and yet they, they have division and they have some fighting and some different things that are going on among them? Do you know why it's true? It's true because of who they were filled with. In Romans chapter 8, Paul spent a lot of time talking to them about the fact that they were filled with the Spirit of Christ, the Holy Spirit of God that was inside of them. You know what happens? Before we get saved, we're just like this empty bottle. When it comes to goodness and when it comes to knowledge, before you know Jesus as your Savior, you're empty. Now, you might think, that's pretty insulting. I I can do some good things. I know some things. But you know what the Bible says? Even our righteousness is as filthy rags. Compared to the righteousness of Jesus, anything that we good we do in life pales in comparison. Are we even able to do good if it's not done in the name of Jesus Christ? We're empty when it comes to that. We're empty when it comes to knowledge. The Bible says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Apart from God and apart from his word and apart from us humbling ourselves and putting our faith and trust in him, do we really know anything that can really impact somebody and make a difference in their life? And the answer to that is no. Again, we're empty in that. But the moment you believe, the moment you get saved, guess what happens? Oh, man, I'm going to shake a lot. I'm going to spill this everywhere. Look at that. That emptiness goes to a complete filling. And I'm shaking because it's Sunday morning. And all of a sudden, you are no longer empty, but you are filled with the Holy Spirit of God. To the point even where we overflow. What I love about that is he doesn't just fill us and leave us like a little bit short. Man, we're filled, we're filled like those water bottles are. You take those caps off and the water sprinkles all over you. You ever do that? You're driving around in the car, you need a drink of water, and the next thing you know, you've got your wet everywhere because that bottle. But that's the idea. We're filled to the point where we're overflowing. I like the way that he ends that verse because he says, even to the point where you're able to admonish one another, you're able to instruct You're able to encourage. You're able to warn. You're able to exhort. He's saying, you have the Holy Spirit of God, and the Holy Spirit of God is filled with all goodness, and he's filled with all knowledge, and you're filled with him. So boast in the fact that you have all of Jesus there is to get. You have everything that you need to be used for God's honor and for God's glory. Now, it gets even better than that. I want you all to look underneath your seats. I got a bottle of water for you down there. Just kidding. I don't, okay? Some of you fell for it. Some of you didn't even move. You're just like, I don't know what he's doing, but I'm not doing that. Okay. I thought about bringing a bottle of water for all of you this morning, but I figured that that would be not worth the 400 bottles of water or so that we'd have to get. But I want to draw your attention to the fact that the next time you pick up a bottle of water, I want you to think about what we're talking about here. And I want you to imagine that I've got my bottle of water and you got your bottle of water, and you got to understand that Paul is addressing the church as a whole. He's not just saying it to us as individually. Yes, we know that we are filled with every bit of the Holy Spirit that we can get, right? We, we know that. You, you see that right there. But yet we know the fact that, that we're still far from perfect, right? We're still growing. We, we still lack in goodness. We still lack in abilities. We still lack in wisdom. We don't have all of the answers. But when you take the church and you combine it and everybody brings their unique gifts and their unique abilities and their unique knowledge, when we all bring it together to the table, You are filled with all goodness. You are full of knowledge, and we are able to meet the needs of one another. What that means is what I lack, someone else in here is able to make up that difference in my life, and they're able to minister to me. And where, where they lack, I have something that I can use to minister to them. And if we're both lacking, somebody else in here has something that we're missing, and we're able to meet the needs of each other so that we can grow in grace and we can be used for God's honor and for God's glory. Last night, right before I went to bed, I opened up Facebook just for a second, and um, first post that was on there was by Daniel Simino. Daniel's over here. Wave hi to everybody, Daniel. It encouraged my heart. I'm calling him out this morning. I told him I was going to do that, but it encouraged my heart because his post went exactly along the lines of what we're talking about here. He just said something along the lines of, my heart is so filled 
with being a part of a body of Christ and the way that they're able to minister. And I think he even said in there something about overflowing to the point. Do you understand that that's the relationships that God wants us to have with one another? We can be filled to the point where we're able to overflow and we're able to meet the needs of one another. And so here is a question by way of practical application that I want you to ask yourself this morning. How am I making a difference? Jesus uses us. How am I making a difference? I was listening to a message this week and I came across a quote that just jumped out at me. I think that's so true. He said this, the potential of the members of the church is the most underused and untapped resource of the body of Christ. The potential of the members of the church is the most untapped and unused resource of the body of Christ. Think about it. Do you see yourself as a vital member of the body of Christ? When you think about yourself, do you get up every day and you say, hey, I am a part of something bigger than me, and God wants to use me specifically to make a difference for him? Hey, do you see that you have gifts and abilities, goodness and knowledge inside of you that someone else needs? Do you look at yourself that way? Do you value yourself that way? And I'm not talking about doing it in a prideful way. I'm talking about the fact that I was empty and I was broken and I was lost, but now I'm transformed and now I'm filled with the Holy Spirit of God and there is a goodness and a knowledge inside of me that is his goodness and his knowledge and I need to be used for his honor and for his glory. Somebody else needs what I have. Do you view yourself that way? If you don't, you're missing the boat. You're missing everything incredible that God wants to do in your life. You know what I'm afraid that we do too often? I'm afraid that we limit ministry and the idea of our ministering to things that happen on Sunday mornings and Sunday nights. A lot of times you'll hear from the pulpit, hey, we need you to take a next step. We need you to serve. We need people to help in the nursery. And all the parents said, oh, that wasn't very convincing right there. We always need people helping in the nursery. We need people to help in children's ministry. We need people to to be a part of the first impressions and and to have a smiling face as you're coming into the property and to, to meet visitors and to make people feel welcome. Hey, we need teachers. We need preachers. Hey, we need all of those things. We need camera operators. There's people that are joining us on live stream today that aren't able to be here in person and the word of God's being able to go forward. I mean, we need people to sing in the choir and people to use their talents that God's given them and their musical ability. We need all of those things. They're all wonderful and they're all important. But you understand, ministry does not stop When our services end and we don't no longer need that until next Sunday or until the next Wednesday night. Ministry happens every single day of our lives. When you got saved, God gave you a gift. Some of you have the gift of giving. Some of you are just naturally generous people. And you love to be able to give. You give people the shirt off their back. Sometimes you give to your own detriment. You don't even have anything for yourself because you just naturally love to give. And God uses that to be an encouragement in other people's lives. Hey, some of you have the gift of discernment. Some of you are able just to see right through a situation and just to call it out. And you're like, no, that is not right. That's not a good thing. And you know what? Some, we need discernment. We need people with that. Some of you have the gift of serving. Some of you just, you don't mind. You just want to be behind the scenes and you just want to jump in. And wherever there's a need, you're more than happy to step in and to fill that need and to meet that need. Some of you have the gift of faith. Man, I like being around people that are full of faith. You look at an obstacle and and someone might be pessimistic and and they're looking at that glass and they're saying, man, it is half full. Everything's going to go wrong. I like being around those people that are optimistic and they're like, oh no, that glass glass is half full. And we serve a powerful, miracle-working, wonderful God who can step into that situation and he can change it. Hey, why don't we pray and talk to him right now about that? Man, some of you are filled with faith. Do you understand that in all of these giftings that God has given us, when we boast in Jesus and the fact that we are full of goodness and filled with all knowledge, there is an infinite amount of ways that you, in your unique way that God made you and created you, can go outside of these doors and impact your work and impact your community and even continue to impact one another by serving and realizing that there's something inside of you that God has given you to be used for his honor and for his glory. So the question is this. How am I making a difference? Where there's no vision, the people perish. Man, do you just go into work every day? Are you just doing your job? Or do you, again, realize that you got something inside of you 
And who are you targeting? And how are you using your life to bring honor and glory to God in every single area of your life? Hey, boast in Jesus. Jesus uses us. And that's exciting to know that we're no longer empty and broken. We are filled with the knowledge and full of all goodness of God. All right, secondly, not only should we boast in Jesus because he uses us, but secondly, Jesus calls us. Boast in Jesus. Jesus calls us. Look at verse 15. Look at what Paul says. Paul had a call on his life. life. He says in verse 15, Nevertheless, brethren, I have written the more boldly unto you in some sort, as putting you in mind because of the grace that is given to me of God. And then verse 16, that I should be the what? What's that word right there? That I should be the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles. What's that next word? Ministering the gospel of God. Paul was bold to write a letter to a church that he had never been to and to people that he had never met because that was his job. That's what he's telling them. Hey, I know I don't know you, but I'm still bold to write this letter to you because God called me to be an apostle to the Gentiles. He called me in a very special way, and you're a Gentile church in a Gentile city, and so my ministry is to you. And what I'm saying to you is not my words, it's actually God's words. That's why I'm so bold to do this. But what we have to notice about this, and I like this is so important to understanding where this is. Paul does not refer to himself in this verse as an apostle. I said that because that's something that we know about Paul. Do you know how Paul refers to himself? He referred to himself as a what? God, some of you got that. Okay, the word that I had you read. Paul referred to himself as a minister. Now, that word minister, it can be used in a very general sense, just to mean actually a minister or a servant. But it can also be used to refer to priestly ministry. Stay with me here, okay? Don't miss this. Paul views his calling as priestly ministry. Paul viewed himself as a priest, as a mediator between God and man. His job as a child of God was to go to a world that was lost and to lift high the name of Jesus and to be that mediator to bring people to God. And you see that come clear at the way, in the way that he ends verse 16. Go back to verse 16 with me. It says this, that I should be the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God. And then everybody help me out loud on the whole end of this verse, okay? Everybody out loud, here we go that the offering up of the Gentiles might be acceptable, being sanctified by the Holy Ghost. Paul is picturing himself as a priest, and he's serving others using the gospel of God. He's preaching the gospel of God. He's saying, hey, Jesus lived, he died, he was buried, he rose again, you need to believe in him, he's not ashamed of the gospel. And the Gentiles that are getting saved, he's presenting them back to God as an offering that is acceptable to God. He's saying, hey, God saved me, he transformed me, he changed me, and he gave me this incredible ministry, and I'm preaching the gospel, I'm serving others with the gospel of Jesus, and my offering back to God are all of these Gentiles who have put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And all of this is going to verse 17. Can I tell you this morning, Paul had a reason to boast. Paul had a reason to boast. Look at verse 17. He says this, I have therefore whereof I may glory. Essentially, you could just summarize that and you could say, I have reason to boast. That's what Paul's saying. Literally, that's what he's saying here. Not in himself, he says, though, through Jesus Christ in those things which pertain to God. Do you understand that when God saved Paul and when God called Paul into the ministry, that as a result, literally thousands upon thousands of people had put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Literally, churches all around the world had been planted and started. God used Paul to write a good portion of the New Testament, more than anybody else wrote in the New Testament. God used the Apostle Paul to do that. 2,000 years later, we are talking about Paul and the work that God did in and through him. And he's saying, hey, listen, church at Rome... I'm writing to you because this is what God's called me to do. And I'm bold in writing to you because God has used me. And there are people that have been saved. And I want you to understand that I'm doing all of this because ultimately he's going to go, and we're going to look at it next week, to the fact that he wants to partner with them. He's saying, you have everything you need to be used for the glory of God. And I want to partner with you to reach more people in Spain and more people around the world. So he's saying, hey, you got everything you need? So get busy doing the work that God has called you to do. So here's the question 
by way of practical application and bringing this all in. What am I boasting in? What am I boasting in? I listened to a lot of messages this week on Romans chapter 15. And one of them also talked about the fact that uh, he's from Los Angeles, the guy that was preaching. And it was several years ago. And he, he's not even a sports fan, but he's like, I was driving around the city one day. And I realized that everybody was wearing purple and yellow. And he's like, the Lakers had won a championship, the NBA championship. And literally everywhere he went, man, there's Lakers flags and there's Lakers jerseys and there's people that are just out on their streets and they're cheering and they're screaming and they're like, yeah, the Lakers have won a championship. Woo! All of you in here know I'm an Alabama fan. Alabama wins championships. I'll just be quiet right there. I don't want to be cocky like that, but I am going to be. No, listen, the fact is Alabama wins championships, and when they win, it's fun to put on your shirts, and it's fun to to be the champions. But when you put all of this into perspective, and we get so worked up over sports, and we get so worked up over teams, and there's a world that is lost and dying and going to hell, and we boast more in our athletic accomplishments, or we boast more in our sports teams, or we boast more in our hobbies, or we boast more in our work accomplishments. Something is drastically and seriously wrong. The fact that we can come and we can edify and we can encourage and we can talk and we can debate about the weather and about our sports teams and about everything that's going on, but very rarely do we turn the conversation and point it to Jesus. Something is wrong. Paul's boasting in Jesus, and he's not wrong to do it because he's saying, my work is his work. This is what he's called me to do. This is what he's enabled me to do. I'm not boasting in myself. I'm boasting in what God has done in me and through me. And the whole thrust of where Paul's going with this is this. All believers are called to be evangelists, and all evangelists offer their converts to God. And you know what this means for you and me? I'm a priest. You are a priest. We are ministers. If you're saved, you are a minister of God. You are a priest. You are a mediator in this world. Our job is to point people to Jesus. We have a high and holy calling. We have something great and wonderful to live for, something greater than sports, something greater than work, something greater than our hobbies. We have a God and Savior that we can live for. Boast in Jesus. Hey, it is this reality The reality that we're all evangelists and all evangelists offer their converts to God, it's this reality that unites the church's two major roles. And you know what our two major roles as a church are? Worship and witness. This morning we're gathered here and you know what we were doing? We have been worshiping Jesus. Man, my heart got full. I was brought to tears when we were singing I Trust in God right after we got done singing Same God. And man, we go through testimony after test. You are a healer then. You are a healer now. You were a provider then. You are a provider now. You set the captives free. You you do miracle after miracle. He goes through that whole list. And my heart just starts getting full. And I start thinking about Jesus and what he did for me on the cross. And I start thinking about, God, who, who am I that I'm filled with all your goodness and wisdom? Who am I that you would save me? Who am I that I I would get to stand up here and preach the unsearchable riches of Christ and we get filled with worship? And you know why he wants us to be filled with worship? So it overflows out of us into witness and we go out into this world and we proclaim the goodness of the gospel and we go to people and we say, hey, yes, you're broken and you're a sinner and you're looking for hope and you're looking for answers and his name is Jesus and he can change everything about your life. That's what God wants us to do in our lives. And here's the reality. If your witness is dead, it's because your worship is dead. If your witness is dead, it's because your worship is dead. You know what we do? We get saved and we get excited, man. We are glad to be filled with all the goodness of God. But you know what we do with that goodness of God? We take this cap and we put it right back on. And we're like, you know what? I'm glad that I'm saved. I'm glad I have a relationship with God. I'm glad that I know that I'm going to heaven. But outside of that, just leave me alone. Don't mess with my life. And you know what we start telling ourselves? We start thinking about ourselves and we start putting a cap on the wisdom that God wants to overflow out of us in a lot of different ways. We start saying things like, I'm not a priest. That that sounds ridiculous. I'm not a priest. Yes, you are a priest. And you start saying, 
well, you don't know my past. I mean, my past is so messed up and so broken. There's no way that God can use me. And can I tell you that God redeems the ugliest and most broken past, and he uses it in incredible ways. You start thinking, man, well, I'm not talented like Paul. I got no gifts like he has. That's a lie from Satan. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. You start thinking, my testimony's boring. Man, I mean, I grew up in a Christian house, and I got saved at like eight, and I haven't done drugs, and I haven't got messed up into stuff. Do you understand what you're saying? Praise God for that. There are people here that have been messed up with that stuff, that have been transformed, and they're thankful that God saved them and delivered them. And if you've been spared from that, you got a testimony for God's honor and for God's glory. You know what we do? We just we sit there, and, and, and maybe we get filled with pride. And we're like, okay, fine, I'm a priest, and I'm filled with all goodness, but... I just want to live my life. I don't want to do that. I don't, I don't really want to. And we might not ever say those words out loud, but inside we think I'm like, I'm not going to change the way that I'm living to be a testimony for God. I mean, I, I, I want, I got to work overtime this week and I've got to get a bigger house and I've got to get that next promotion. And we just continue to live the same way over and over again. And you know what we do? We screw this lid on tighter and tighter because all that is, is I, 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 I. And you know what Paul's saying? Get your eyes off of yourself and fix them on Jesus. You know what Paul said about his life? I, I look, Paul had a Paul had an awesome life going for him until he met Jesus. I mean, in Philippians chapter 3, he lays out his testimony. It's not like he was some derelict. It was not like his life was a mess and broken and he had nowhere else to turn. No, this man was turning the world upside down in his own right. He was successful. He was a leader. I mean, he had people following him. He was passionate about the things he was doing. And then he met Jesus. And you know what he says? Everything in my past... Every single thing that I used to take pride in, everything that I used to take joy in, I count it but dung. It's a pile of trash. It's rubbish. Everything that I accomplished in my own strength, everything that this world gave me, it's nothing. It's nothing but a big pile of steamy trash all in comparison to the fact that I know Christ and I know the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering. And all he says is, I want more of Jesus and I want more of his power and I want to be used more and more and more. And I don't want nothing else in the past. I just want more of God's power and more of his work and and more of him working in my life. That's what Paul's saying. And you know what I'm afraid of? I'm afraid that too many of us are going to get to heaven and all we're going to have to present to God is just a big pile of smoky rubbish because we're too concerned about our own lives and the things that we think are going to fulfill and satisfy. And you know what else I know is true? There's a whole lot of unfulfilled people that are sitting in here this morning. There's a whole lot of unfulfilled people that are sitting in churches all across America. There are a whole lot of unfulfilled people outside of those walls. You know what the definition of insanity is? Doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. And we get up and we're blessed and God's been so good to us. And yet we just continually do the same things and that there's something missing. Can I tell you what's missing? What's missing is we're not allowing the Holy Spirit of God to work in us and through us the way that he wants to for his honor and for his glory. And that leads me to the last point. Jesus empowers us. Jesus empowers us. Look at what he says in verse 18. For I will, dare, for I will not dare to speak of any of those things which Christ has not wrought by me. To make the Gentiles obedient. And then look at what he says in those last four words. Everybody out loud, help me out. By word and deed. God worked in Paul's life by word and deed. Just a real quick practical application. Preach the word. Preach the word. You know what we're supposed to do as priests? We're supposed to preach the word. Word. Look at verse 19. He says, through mighty signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and roundabout until Illyricum, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. You know what Paul did? He opened his mouth and he proclaimed the gospel of Christ. And he did it from Jerusalem, where it all started, to Illyricum, probably the furthest away that he made it from Jerusalem. And he fully preached the gospel of Christ. He preached the word. He declared the gospel. He told people about Jesus and who he is and what he had done for him and how he can change their lives. That's what he did. And then look at verses 20 and 21. He says, Yea, 
So have I strived to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, lest I should build upon another man's foundation. But as it is written, to whom he was not spoken of, they shall see, and they that have not heard shall understand. You know what Paul's driving passion was in life? To take the gospel to people that had never heard it before. And you know what his driving passion was? To speak, to preach the word, to give the word, to help people to understand who had never heard about the good news of Jesus, about the transforming power of Jesus, about the hope that there is in Jesus. And you know what Paul did? He preached the word. And you know what else he did? His life backed up what he preached. He preached in word and deed. There was action there. His life fully backed up that I'm not just saying words. I really genuinely believe that the power of the gospel is the greatest thing that's ever happened to me to the point that he was willing to be shipwrecked. He was willing to be beaten. He was imprisoned. He was mocked and ridiculed. He had his head chopped off at the end of his life. Trust me, his actions backed up what he believed. So preach the word in word and in deed. Live your life in a way where you're proclaiming the gospel and your actions prove that what you're saying, you truly believe it. And then you know what's awesome? See God's power. Look back at verse 18, uh, verse 19. Look at what he says in verse 19. Everybody, help me read that out loud, okay? What's the first line there? He says what? Through mighty signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God. You might be saying, Pastor Mike, come on now, I know that Paul and the apostles were used by God in some incredible ways, different than, than, than how he uses us. And it's true. Paul, God used the apostles in a special way to establish the church, and they literally touched people and they were healed. They cast out demons. They raised dead people to life. I mean, how many of you would like to see a miracle like that? There's even things in the Bible that are interesting. Paul was bitten by a venomous snake that should have killed him within minutes, and he didn't even, like, nothing even happened to him. And the people went from thinking that he was like the devil to he was a god, and they started worshiping him. Paul had a handkerchief that got passed around, and when it touched people, they got healed. Now, am I saying that at the end of the service, I'm going to sell handkerchiefs that you touch and you can get healed? No. That's not the point. I'm just saying that there was a time after Jesus rose into heaven before the word of God was complete, that there were signs and wonders, miracles that God did through the apostles. And as you go through the New Testament, they decreased rapidly. They were very significant right after Jesus rose and went to the grave, but then they decreased because you know why? The word of God came on the scene. The word of God came on the scene. Signs and wonders confirmed God's word. Here's the last question, the last practical application, and we're going to wrap this up. Who am I reaching? Who am I reaching with the gospel of Jesus Christ? If we're going to boast in Jesus, am I making a difference? What am I boasting in? Is there there anybody that I can present to God as my offering of worship because I've, I've done what he says? Who am I reaching? This is where this is all leading. And you know what the great news is today? We don't have a de supernaturalized religion. You might be sitting there thinking, well, If I can't come down and heal people and cast out demons, does that mean that the power of God is still not at work? And I say to you, no, that is the biggest false statement ever. There is still the power of God. What we have now is a centralized religion that is focused on the truth of this word right here. And the word of God has power. And you know the beauty of this? I'm bringing out this bottle right here. When Paul and the apostles were preaching in the New Testament, man, they would go to those people that were that needed to be healed, or someone that was demon-possessed, even the dead. And you know what? They were empty. And when they believed in Jesus, oh man, they got filled with the Holy Spirit of God. And guess what? As they got filled, as they believed, they experienced healing. Isn't that pretty awesome? They experienced physical healing, but better than that, they experienced spiritual healing. You know what else? They were set free. Man, there was some bondage. There were some some demons that were possessing their life and taking over. And I I think about people that are addicted and struggle with those types of things. And man, it's, it's almost like a demonic oppression. And you know what? The power of the gospel can set people free. Can set you free from your past and from your bonds and from your chains. You know what else happens when somebody believes in Jesus Christ? They go from death to life. 
And you might feel hopeless, and you might feel lost, and you might feel abandoned, but when we preach the word of God, when we say it with our mouths, when we live it out and we back it up with our actions, man, we get a front row seat to seeing healing, to seeing deliverance, to seeing new life, to seeing transformation. Next week, next week we have like 14, 15 different people that are getting baptized. People that have gone from death to life. People that are being transformed by the power of a supernatural God who's still able to deliver and who's still able to do incredible things. And you know what the challenge is to us? We've got to take the lid off. We've got to take that lid off. I think probably more people in here this morning than not have that lid screwed on real tightly in their lives. And the whole point is this. Jesus uses us. He wants to use you. He's called you. You are a priest. And he has empowered us with the Holy Spirit of God. We are full of goodness. We are filled with knowledge. The world needs what you have, which is not you, it's Jesus. And if we take the lid off and we say, okay, God, I'm done saying I, and I'm done making excuses, and I'm done being blinded, and I'm done not living for anything in particular or anything bigger than myself, but here's my life, take it and use it. And we determine. You know what? It's, it is literally this simple. You make the decision that you're going to go out of here and you're going to preach the word with your mouth and with your actions. You're going to look at your neighborhood. You're going to look at your work. And you're going to say, God, who, who have you put in my life that I need to be a blessing to? Who in this church can I serve today? Who can I use my gifts to better? And you know what? We speak the truth of God's word and we show it and we demonstrate it by our actions. And when we do that, oh, we take the lid off the power of God. And when that power of God starts working in our lives and you start getting a taste of it, you're not going to want to go back to anything the way you were living before. You're going to want more and more and more, and you're going to worship more, and you're going to witness more, and there's going to be people that are sitting next to you in church because of the impact that you made on them, and you're going to look over, and you're going to see tears coming down their face, and you're going to see the glory of God all over their lives, and it's going to fill your heart with worship and praise, and then you're going to go out, and you're going to want to witness more, and the Spirit of God will be with you, and He will enable you. You want to live for something greater and bigger than yourself? You want that emptiness, that lack of fulfillment to go away. You want your worship to be on fire. Tell people, open up your mouth and declare the truth of this book and live it out every single day of your life and watch God do some incredible things.